Hi, I'm Patrick O'Brien, and welcome to the first episode of the Film Stooges. Today we're joined by actor Steve Warrington. You may know him from such films as Last of the Mohicans, Sleepy Hollow, recently had a film in the cinema, Uncharted, and TV shows like Jamestown and The Tudors, and at the moment has a TV show streaming on Apple TV every Friday, Slow Horses. Steve wasn't able to get here today, but we caught up with him on Zoom, so let's go and check that out. So, uh, hi, Steve. Thanks for joining us today. It's nice to see you again. How are you doing? I know. It's been a very long time. It's been nearly two years, I think. And, um, yeah, it was, uh, when we got in touch, it was um, during Uncharted, wasn't it? Is it, wasn't it, when I was in yeah, you couldn't tell. Yeah, you couldn't tell me that at the time, but, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, you were um, away filming. I think it was just before COVID, I think. So, um, it's been a, it's right. been a while. Yeah. It has been a while, yeah. That was a, it's a really strange time because we um, we did about two weeks prep, and uh, we know we did the boot camp and all that stuff leading up to doing the shoot. Uh, and after about two weeks, COVID was kind of circumnavigating the globe, and we had an eye on it. We're thinking, what's this? You know, it won't touch us. We'll be absolutely fine. And then, literally on the day we were supposed to shoot, first day they said, look, we're going to have to halt this, and um, and it was a bit scary, you know, because I thought um, this might. This, this might not come back, you know, this could go away because nobody knew at that time, if we remember, you know, just exactly how all that was going to play out. So anyway, we went away for three months and uh, came back and then, then we started shooting, thankfully. But I think it was in that time that you and I had a little um, first time together. So that's probably, so that's got to be around 2020. Yeah, I mean, uh, congratulations on the film, by the way. I uh, I actually went to watch that in the cinema about three times. Your character made me laugh every time. Uh, I think the first interaction with Tom Holland that you had, um, I think <laughs> I, th I think that's really taken off that point. Um, but I mean, what was it like working on Uncharted? Because I mean, that, it, first of all, it was a major like game franchise, and then to turn it into a film. And like you were saying, obviously there was a lot of problems with obviously COVID. But that film also took a very long time to actually put together. Because if I've heard correctly, Mark Wahlberg originally was supposed to be Tom Holland, and then it because it took so long to put together. It ended up well. That's obviously, right. he was too old, yeah. and um, that's right. He was originally going to be playing Tom's part, yeah. And, and um, so that tells you in itself, doesn't it? I think it was almost a decade. It was six six years to a decade, I think, that they um, that they had that going, and it had various directors attached. And you know, you're always aware that you're carrying that weight on your shoulders as well when it's got um, a, an audience from from the gaming world and all those things. But you, as an actor, you can't really take that on board. You just think, look, I mean, I've been cast in this movie. We've you just have to make the movie we're making. And luckily, the script was good. It was a nice, fun popcorn movie, some great adventure. Uh, Tom, obviously, is doing really well in Spider-Man and all that, so yeah. brought that uh, does to it. And, um, and yeah, and they, they, I thought it was a good combo, uh, Mark and Tom. I thought they, they really worked well together. Uh, you could see that on, on, on set, and I think it worked on screen, seemed to sparkle a bit on screen as well, you know. Yeah, I mean, it definitely was one of them really good, you know, it was very easy watching, you know, like a, you know, if, if you know, something you could take the whole family to and things like that. So, I mean, um, I mean, as I said, I think your line made me crack up every time I was in the cinema, even though I heard it about four times. But, um, I mean, God, yeah, I mean, it was just like at the time it coming out, you know, obviously such a big game and like, obviously it must have been a lot of pressure going into something like that, you know, so you mean, would it live up to the game? And, you know, did you feel anything like that going into it? Like, I think, you know, had I been the director or Tom Holland and Mark, I probably would have, you know, mm. I, I guess I felt, I, I felt the appropriate amount of percentage of that, you know, I, I was aware of all that. And I was obviously I was hoping it would be successful. I mean, in the UK, it didn't get great um, reviews at all, uh, but kind of to be expected in a way, it's, it's not, a, it's not Shakespeare. It's not an Oscar movie or anything like that. You know, it's a fun popcorn adventure film and when I saw it actually I realized how how young an audience it was aimed at suddenly it became it became cl uh, much clearer um uh, you know when you when you watch those films or when you're making them you, you're trying to bring some kind of truth and energy to it and, and trying to make the best the best version of those characters that you can you can actually bring and uh, I think everyone did that but it's only when you see it all wrapped up in all its glory and and, and see the um see it on the big screen that you know what kind of movie you've made and what kind of uh, movie the uh, director really wanted and all the post-production is, or post-production, post excuse me, is is involved. You you really get a sense of what you've been part of because it yeah. it's incremental. It's, the journey's incremental every time. I mean, like, 
how long were you working on that? I mean, because obviously such a big budget film and things like that. How long were you actually from like pre-production, like, you know, all the way through filming? How long was that? Well, I mean, the pre-production, um, I wouldn't know about uh, apart from the two weeks that we had, uh, the two yeah. weeks prep. But obviously they were working on it for probably a year before that. Um, but the production itself was um, a three, was it three or four months? Four months, I think four months. That's right. We'd, um, I think we did uh, three months in Berlin. Then we went to um, Barcelona. Um, so it was, it felt big. You know, it felt my you looked at the script and and um, and it had those stars and all that stuff attached to it and it's it, it never it never didn't feel like a big epic movie you know so yeah you, 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 that that I mean that's a great feeling as well it's uh, I suppose it's a lot of pressure if you if you take it that way but it's um for me it just it, it, it's always I've done a few studio films like that and it's mm. um they're always very different to your independent films and yeah. you're always aware in a studio film and it's it just has a different feel you know they have more time things are done properly there's more money um for the production and things like that so it had all those all, all those things you know which are which are not bad things to have and every so often to make one of those films is, is not a bad thing you know it's, it's a real treat yeah oh no i completely get that i mean um what i was going to say was i mean this isn't your first um your first time out on a uh, video game franchise being turned into a well, obviously not a film this time, but you did a TV series back in 2014 based on the Halo game series, which that time was an Xbox game, not PlayStation. Um, but like, how did you find the difference between like, obviously working on a game franchise then like to now, did things like change like with CGI and things along that line? Yeah, they, you know, they have, I mean, obviously they, they probably had different budgets. I mean, that was a Ridley Scott production, the um, Halo yeah. Night, and it was a great shoot. We had a great blast on that. Um, and I thought they did really well, you know, um, to say that it wasn't a big studio film. Um, the difference is, I suppose, you know, let's fast forward from 2014 to 2020. Suddenly, you, you know, th there's a lot of, not motion capture, but and I wouldn't even know the real technical term for it, but you have to go into this booth, that you, which is literally surrounded by over 2,000 cameras taking every single angle of you, just in case there is a moment that they need to take you and your image and put it into a different situation. For example, maybe in a stunt or some, whatever whatever the, um, uh, the piece might be. So they've literally got your image from every single angle. Now, we didn't do any of that on Halo, and, and I'm not sure that the technology was around there, or maybe it was there being developed or something, but that was a major change. So every, every, I'd say every month we had to go into this booth and just get photographed for about, um, I don't know, five minutes of just flashing, <laughs> flashing photography, like completely 360 all the way around. So that, that's, that's a major change. I mean, other changes... I don't know. You know, the green screen's been around for a long time. That's that. That's always there mm. in those big movies. Um, we did a little bit of that as well in, in Halo, I think. Uh, but yeah, I thought Halo did quite well. I haven't seen it for a long time. So I'll have a little look at that again because yeah. uh, that was a good little movie. Well, I guess where the question's going to at the moment is, are you an Xbox or a PlayStation guy after um, doing one movie for PlayStation and one for Xbox? I um, Or do you I'm play little... games? I'm not a massive gamer, but the, but the only reason I'm not is because I actually do like it yeah. probably too. So I actually, right. I, I like to write and I like to um, uh, um, do some art and do other things. And I find that it really eats into my time because you know what it's like if you're a gamer. I mean, you, mm. you, and it can go by, can it? <laughs> oh, easily. Right you game, can, exactly. You can never believe how much time, how, how, how quickly the time goes. So I've actually made a concerted effort not to get entangled in that. I'll have a little dabble every now and then, but I mean, when, when I realised I got Uncharted and all that, it was, um, I did have a little look at the game, which was great. Um, I mean, if I had to choose between the two, I'd say PlayStation, actually. Okay. All right. Okay. PlayStation, man. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, um, so like going on with like taking up your time and things like that, um, like I've been obviously following you on social media for quite a while now. And um, one thing I've always liked about your social media is you've got a really chilled, laid back sense to you. You know, you don't take it too seriously. I almost feel like there's a lot of videos you put, you're actually making fun of yourself in a lot of the videos, which I think is, it's really funny to, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's quite, uh, I'm trying to think of the way you're putting it, like, um, 
instead of being really serious and it's just all promotion, 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 you make these like funny little, uh, you know, skits that you put up and things like that. So yeah, I was going to, so mean, like ob- obviously since, you know, you've been in the industry, do you feel like things like Instagram or Facebook or YouTube help an actor or a filmmaker get out there? And, it's a good question, Nick, yeah. because it, it's debatable. And, and I think, for me, um, I, I when I started my acting career, it was I started. I'd always done quite a bit of comedy, um, it, it, you know, in, in in learning to be an actor. But when it came to um, the films and the TV shows and things of theatre that people were seeing, it was all very serious. So, almost as an antidote to that, when I discovered Instagram, when I saw that you could, and I've always wanted to be a filmmaker. So, and I see it as filmmaking, you know, I, I know it's, I know it's 30 seconds or it's a minute or you, know, you can have five minutes or whatever you have. But I, as soon as I realized it, it wasn't just a photograph of your coffee that you have to put out there. And I saw that I could have a minute. I thought, well, I can just start making films here. This is brilliant. And, um, and, and I guess my, my natural side came out, which is um, to, to sort of look at the humorous side of life, I think. And I get certain, you know, I, I can't complain. I get so many great opportunities to do the serious side of life in the dramatic pieces that I'm, that I'm sometimes involved in. So it was nice to just be able to, um, yeah, brush off that, that seriousness. Yeah, exactly. Be yeah. yourself and have a little and push the boundaries and do things that I've, I've not even done before, you know, and, and let that evolve. Uh, but in, in, you know, I'm not, I'm not adverse to doing a serious Instagram occasionally if something comes on, but I just feel that it's a lovely playground for people to um, lighten the mood a little bit, you know? Yeah. I mean, I would say that because like when I watch it, I feel like, you know, you're actually showing the real you. It's not a, a sort of like, okay, I'm playing a character on there. People need to think I'm cool or, you know, whatnot. Because, I mean, like, other things as well, like, um, with, like, social media and things like that, like, uh, which I was going to ask you about, because, I mean, your career started in the 90s, didn't it? So, you know, there wasn't things like IMDb, you know, uh, Zoom calls like this now. Um, I mean, I mean, I, I was acting from, like, the age of 10, and uh, there was no such thing as a self-tape then or something like that it was like if you had an audition you'd have to get on a train to London or you know a train to Scotland or whatever which for an audition you might not even get where now like you can go and send them a tape if they don't want you you don't waste an entire day traveling somewhere and going back so I mean do you feel like these type of platforms have really helped I mean since Covid as well Zoom has become so big like with meetings and things like that and it saves you actually having to leave and go somewhere and waste that entire day when you could just come on Zoom for half an hour or an hour. I think, yeah, the evolution is, um, it's been fantastic in a way, isn't it? And by, and by that, I mean supersonics. Like it's, it's, gone, it's gone so quickly and, and it's hard even to cast your mind back and think of before it was around. But yeah, the changes have been um, huge, really. I mean, the, this whole self-tape thing kind of crept up on us a little bit, even before uh, lockdown. But and it, uh, <laughs> It wasn't necessarily the everyone's first choice, but obviously during lockdown it, it became the only choice, and 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 I think it's left a residue there. And people are looking at overheads, and you know, look at this office that I'm renting, and um, uh, bringing all these people across into different cities or into town or whatever it be. And it suddenly cut out a lot of um, a lot of legwork, didn't it? And and I think um, a lot of that's for the better as well. I know everybody says, oh, it's better to be in the room and all that stuff. And I think if, you know, if, if, if we were going for something as actors and, and we, um, our self tapes were uh, looked at favorably, we'd probably find ourselves in the room. You know what I mean? It probably gets to that stage, but um, I think it's a pretty useful tool. I do. I, yeah. I think, you know, and, and for actors being in charge of their own self tapes as well, I think that's a good thing as well, you know, because often you you're so nervous at an audition, really, aren't you? You know, there's there's learning the lines and all of that stuff, and then there's a the performance, and then there's how you feel on the day, and all, all so so many what ifs, and you go into the room and you might feel like you didn't give it your best shot, but and then you're out. You know, at least when you're doing it yourself, you just have that little bit of creative control, and I think that can only be a good thing, and maybe a good thing for the casting directors to receive something that's received a little bit more attention, a little bit of time. Yeah. So those kind of things, I think, uh, have been profitable um things like yeah um instagram accounts and platforms and it's it's is it too early to tell i don't know i mean for me it's been an outlet you know 
uh, from being like a serious man in that platform and going, I can be an absolute clown on this. You know, I, I, that's actually, it's been great for me. I've, I've enjoyed doing that and not feel like I am a serious actor simply because I've been playing serious roles. And I'm sure other people have had that outlet and maybe they've had the reverse of that. I'm not sure. But I think you can, you know, maybe for uh, inexperienced actors or young actors, get yourself out there somehow on that platform. Do something, find something, uh, you know, not just follow the herd but but find something that um shows you in the light that you'd like to be shown and maybe maybe may get us a little bit closer to getting work as actors directors yeah. or whatever um so it's you, you've seen about acting like a clown and things like that and you know being yourself on social media and you know like even using your social medias as like making little films and things like that so a question I've got for you when I was doing a bit of research and, and obviously following you on social media and whatnot. Uh, can you tell me more about Bob Smallfist? <laughs> Bob Smallfist. Wow. That's one right from, uh, that's from Budapest, isn't it? Uh, Bob. Oh no, sorry. Bob Small. I was thinking of John Bastard Sock. Sorry. That was another. <laughs> I think I did one. I've, I found, I think you did three or four YouTube videos on tips for actors or things actors yeah. shouldn't do. And it was hilarious that like, you were like two or three minute videos, I think, that you'd filmed on your, your iPhone or your Android phone or whatever you were using. And then you just edited them and uploaded them, which is great because like what we were just talking about then, you, you've not gone out and got a big professional camera or something like that. You were just literally in your trailer being yourself and messing around. So I just thought that was brilliant. So where did, th th where did that come from? That came from being in your trailer and sort of waiting, you know, and I thought, hang <sighs> about I why am I wasting this? You, you always feel like if you're productive, like I think you are, you know, you make your own films and things. You, do you not always feel like you should be or could be doing something when you're sat there twiddling your thumbs and waiting? It, it was born out of that. And it was also born out of the notion that um, sometimes the, the, the um, you know, acting lessons and the theory of acting and all that can be pushed over into the absurd a little bit if you if you if you tip it just a little bit one step too far and i thought let me just toy around with that and and it sort of it just it came out of nothing i just started doing it and then and i want to do more of it it's not over do you know what i mean it's just finding the mm. time it's actually i just need a job so i can get in a trailer and then i'll do some yeah. more <laughs> so you'll know i've got a job when i do some more of that because i, I it, it does lend itself that trailer business just perfectly i think but also it, you know people are used to were used to seeing like a minute's worth of something from me and i started getting a little bit indulgent because i found it so funny myself and and people don't tend to stay on and watch the longer things you know that they like that minute um so mm. i'm thinking maybe you know youtube for something like that or something where people have a little bit more time and they're not sort of skipping and scrolling through but i like the character i like the idea and the concepts and uh, you know i'm just waiting for another trailer to start in the next one yeah it, to me it, it seemed very like um a bit alan partridge ish you know it was sort of like playing off all the stereotypes of what actors actually do or they go through or they worry about and then you're just pointing out everything and then when you actually hear it you're like oh oh yeah crap we do do that and we do do this and uh, so yeah i thought that was a really genius idea but like from saying what yeah, you were saying there before about you play a lot of series parts so obviously i god i think the first time i saw you in anything was when i was about seven and i watched last of the mohicans and um, so obviously I've watched a lot of films of yours since then. I mean, um, so you do play a lot of historical roles, a lot of serious roles, a lot of police officers I've noticed. Or, um, you know, um, so like doing that throughout your career and playing all these stir, really stern sort of, um, you know, I'm just, sorry, I'm trying to think of the word, like yeah, just like stern roles in your career. But then you've gone from like things like that to like the parole officer and like which was such a lovable character in that and so funny like if you find that transition easy from going from like something you know doing like a, quite a lot of these serious characters to going and doing something really like um where you've just completely not been serious and you're just sort of having a laugh i think it's it's been given the opportunity isn't it it's, so once you're given the opportunity to do that if you have um I guess if you have the ability to do it and, and, and maybe sometimes people don't even get to um, challenge that, that, that side of themselves because they sometimes were kept so much in the box of, Oh, this, this person does this and this person does that. And 
But once you're given the opportunity, and, and obviously that's the great thing about uh, social media, is you can give yourself the opportunity, can't you? But going yeah. back to the opportunity we're, we're afforded by others, um, yeah, you've got to find yourself in a lucky position to get a comedy film, for example, after do, making, let's say, three or four or five serious films. And I think, as you know, actors would leap at that, you know, because it's it's a contrast. It's like a, a chance to um, show some versatility and and challenge yourself and show another side of, you know, another string to your bone, what, what you can do in, in another field. So for me, something like that was great, just given it, it kind of got me off the track that I was on, in a sense. But then I, I suppose I ended up straight back on that track. If I'd have had social media around that point, then I think it would have been different, you know, because yeah. I think I would have promoted more of that side of myself. Yeah. But, but as I said, that, that that's what other people bring to you. And then the beauty of the social media thing is, is you are your own boss, you're in control, and you can, if you've got the imagination and the, um, the will, you can write yourself something or invent something, create something. And it's kind of up to you then. Yeah, I mean, because obviously I'm from Manchester and uh, you did you filmed the parole officer in Manchester, didn't you? I, I'm not sure if all of it was filmed in Manchester, but there was quite a big chunk of it filmed in Manchester. And because um, I always remember, I think your one of your first scenes you came in, and I think you, your line was, um, "What was it? I used to hit people, but now I'm a fishmonger." I think it was, <laughs> and I was just in my head. I always thought like it was a lot of improv in that film. Did he allow you to? go off on anything or was it there, well, there wasn't a lot of improv no it was it right. was uh, Manchester and a little bit of Liverpool by the way but um oh right okay um, they're so close together and, and yeah um no they weren't thinking about no there wasn't no it was it was it was it was scripted and and you know it was Henry Normal Steve Coogan and you know it was a good script so um not that not that we I mean, we stuck to the script, but we weren't asked to stick to the script. But I think it's probably a more recent thing where people start vibing and, and improvising and things like that. Uh, and I'm all for that. I love improvisation. So, um, you know, had there been more time for that, that would have been fantastic. But I've not seen that film for a long time. That, yeah. And that made me, your rendition of that line made me laugh. I completely thought about it. I used to hit people, but now I'm a fish monger. That's a very... Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm glad that I can make you laugh. You make, that's made me laugh now. Yeah. Well, I think um, sometimes, you know, if you just say it, say a line straight, and if it's a funny line, you're still going to get a laugh, aren't you? Funny yeah. is funny. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was your hometown, Manchester. Um, um, yeah, there was just, a, I, couldn't, I just I remember us being in Liverpool for some, uh, for some little bits here and there, maybe around the bank area. The, the, yeah. Uh, Bank job and all that stuff, but mainly Manchester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. I mean, so I mean, like going back to what we were talking about there, like you know, you quite like serious roles. I mean, God, when your career started, it was um, Edward the Second, wasn't it? So you sort of like jumped straight in at the deep end, and then obviously next was Last of the Mohicans. You know, Michael Mann in America. So technically, you jumped into it like something. In my opinion, some actors worked their entire career to get to sometimes like so I mean for a, a young actor pretty much straight out of were you straight out of pretty much like acting school when you did them like because I mean you were you 23 when you did Mohicans? I was 23 yes yeah. so I did I yeah. left drama school and I, I did I did a year at the RSC the Royal Shakespeare Company and then I got Edward II and then Last of the Mohicans yeah so and it was quite overwhelming in one sense. In, in another sense, I really took it in my stride and I was going, well, well, I suppose this is what's supposed to happen. This is what you do, you know. But I was always aware that, um, like, even Edward II, you know, to get a lead role in a film was was is what I dreamed about. I'd actually fulfilled. I, I, I said this to someone else, but you know, when we were at drama school, we were all saying, what 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 do you want to achieve? What's your career ambition and I honestly said I want to work at the RSC I want to play a lead in a movie and I want to be in a big Hollywood film and I literally nailed it in in three in three direct and it was like well, what do I do now um and I, I, I sort of I guess I thought you, you just continue doing the same thing but it was actually doing the Mohicans watching Michael Mann the way he directed and orchestrated this huge thing you know that, i mean this is before cgi so when there were a thousand extras Doesn't there were a thousand yeah. extras. it was mighty but watching him i suddenly went i want to i want to be a filmmaker yeah yeah I even I, you know i wanted to continue acting obviously but i 
but it just kind of it opened my eyes to that to that possibility and, and to that challenge and to how amazing it is just he was so it was so inspiring watching him and actually on Edward the second I hadn't had that because I was still totally an actor you know and I, yeah. and I loved playing that role but for some reason watching Michael on that huge landscape there made me think I want a little I want a little piece of that I want to do that I mean, that's brilliant. I mean, we will come to that in a second about the actual filmmaking part, because I'm actually quite interested to ask you about that. But like, obviously, working with Michael Mann and as you were saying, no CGI and, you know, hundreds of thousands of extras. Like, I mean, w- one scene that always got me was the um, the siege at the fort. Like, that must have been, God, recessing them scenes with the explosions and things like that back then must have been, or even the, the battle scene at the end, um, when the ambush happens, like, did that take like a full day to reset with that amount of extras? Good question. Uh, it's a long time ago, isn't it? It's, um, I know that, that those sequences went on for weeks. You know, they weren't like, mm. we'll shoot these in a couple. They went on for weeks, so we were coming back every day. And the reset, the reset, yeah, for what was called Death Valley, where the um, uh, we came from either side, you know, through snaking through that valley that the reset with that was huge yeah I did, so maybe yeah. we got maybe we got five attempts at that in a day something like that and then you know all the inserts of the individual fighting and skirmishes in between all that but the whole thing was huge when you when when i think back uh, and and in a way i suppose that um uncharted wasn't but uncharted is a very small cast of about six or seven characters whereas in mohicans you have your like five or six central characters and you have these swathes of other people around and uh, and these um sort of subtext um uh, the, these um other storylines going on as well that um that are very, just as integral so it, the whole thing seemed multi-layered and, and, and huge and and a little bit mechanical obviously it's not wasn't the digital age so the cameras were massive. They took a lot of took a lot of moving through that tough terrain and all that. So we were sometimes up mountains and hanging off cliffs and things. It's it was a real physical journey that was actually yeah. less than my yeah. I mean, um, me but, personally, I thought that was a great role for you because you started off as a character everyone sort of hated, but gradually you sort of got to get to understand him, and at the end, you actually felt a bit bad for your character, the Major Haywood, wasn't it? Yeah. And um, because you know, at the end, you sacrificed yourself to save the others that you, you know personally you didn't even really like in that film. And um, I mean, I've watched that film probably since I was about seven once a year because um, it is one of my favorite films of all time. So um, I, there was even a place in Manchester I used to go as a kid. And he, do you remember the bit where your carriage goes over a bridge at the beginning? And you're in like a, yeah. a carriage, yeah. And I always used to say as a little kid, so mum and dad, I used to be there going, it's Duncan's Bridge. It's Duncan's <laughs> Bridge like that. So that well, was always, it was a great well, experience, like, you know, watching well, that film as a child. But, um, very you know, like, say, very striking yeah, well, that stay with you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, God, that cliff scene in that film as well. I mean, I, I don't know how close, like, obviously, I know you weren't in that scene yourself. But I don't know if that was actually filmed on a cliff that was that steep, but that must have been... Um, you know, the imagery, especially in that film, was amazing. So, like, yeah, it was really, yeah, really, great, really good job to have. But, you know, like, talking about your role in that film, like, what would you say is, the, like, the hardest role that you've ever taken on? Because, obviously, I know you've played a lot of, you know, iconic historical characters. And, you know, which one was, like, the hardest role to, like, fit into the shoes of? It's a really good question. Um, um, uh, nothing, nothing jumps out, but um, because they're all quite challenging, aren't they? Especially when mm. you're playing someone who's real. I did a film called Carrington, playing a guy called Rex Partridge, and just because he was a real person, I think that was the first time I, I, I played someone that I knew could uh, watch the film. Well, I actually wasn't alive when the film came out. His, his, his wife was, you know, just that kind of um, 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 responsibility brings a different dimension to it because you, you know, you have to, it has to exist properly within the world that's been written, but you're also aware that this person actually existed or exists. And mm. so that's an extra pressure. That's always difficult. I've done it. I think I've done a few of those. And then other roles, like I played Richard the Lionheart in um, for the BBC once. And that was, we filmed that in Morocco and that was, that was like, physically demanding because we were wearing yeah. chain mail it was like pretend chip. We were, we were doing what they would have done and that was a really tough shoot because they had a really 
they had a great idea of using a digital camera so that they can move around and, and, and reset very, very quickly. So the whole thing had a real drive and a rhythm to it. So that was physically very challenging, as well as thinking, oh, my God, I'm Richard the Lion now. You know, I hope I do okay. Um, do, I, do I have this right? You played him twice and you played him in, played in something else <clears throat> as well. That's right, yeah. I played yeah. him twice, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is strange. So you found him really? challenging. You went back to do it again. Yeah. Well, yeah. someone offered it to me, so I was like, yeah, I'll do that. I know him. Um, so they're challenging for different reasons, and it's really difficult to say, oh, this one was the most challenging. I played, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a role <clears throat> in in a film called Face Against the Movie, and um, and the guy that I was playing had learning difficulties. So that's a different thing. Whereas, mm. um, you know, this at uh, this in this age, we we it would be probably I may not even have got the role. It would have been tackled differently. But you know, I yeah. had to go and meet people. Who um, who could influence me, and it was all done in a very strange way, a very sensitive way. But mm. um, you know, that's something that will be handled differently today. And that's when was that? That was ninety seven. So you know, I mean, the world has changed so yeah, much. Yeah, it's very and different. Yeah, and that that was a great. It was a great cast in that film as well, like um, Robert Carlyle, yeah. uh, if I remember correctly. Did and I see a Ray- picture with Bobby the other day? Yes, yeah, don't really <laughs> want to put myself in it. Um, well, yeah, no, that was that was great. I mean, uh, did you was, speak, hang out a little bit? Uh, yeah, I, I spoke to him for a little bit, and um, really nice guy. Um, you know, um, as I say, like um, he just. He... I really have a lot of affection for Bobby. He was really lovely to me on that shoot, and I, I'll never forget that. And he's, um, I think he's a terrific actor, and he's um, inspirational. I always liked him. I'm, I don't, I never see him as much as I'd like to see him, but um, but I'm glad that they're doing the full Monty again as well. I mean, that. Yeah. Look, you know, I've always thought that you know it has legs for something else. I couldn't think what that was, and I'm I'm glad they're having a look at that again because it was it was brilliant. It was blind. He did that yeah. literally on face. He just he just finished Full Monty and he went on to face. And he was and for him, I remember at the time he was going, I think this might be the one, you know, meaning face. It's not mm. <laughs> and Fair came out and did very little actually, and the full Monty obviously went through the roof. So um yeah, but lo- lo- lovely guy. Um yeah, so Ray Winston, uh, Rob um Robert Carlyle, obviously, um, Damon Albarn, and um, Phil Davis, and Andy yeah. Tiernan. Yeah, great cast. I mean, God, I mean, like to go back, uh, like back over the years of all the people you've worked with. I mean, you've you've worked with like the who's who of, I mean, you know, British cinema for sure. I mean, you know, and um, that brings me on to like my next point. You know, like um, congratulations on the new TV series on Apple. Uh, I watched the first few episodes the other night. And um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that and your character? Yeah, so this is um, an Apple TV Plus uh, program starring Gary Oldman, uh, Kristen Scott Thomas. And it's about MI5. It's basically about the winners and the losers in MI5. And um, the losers are basically called slow horses. And Gary Oldman is in charge of them. I'm one of the slow horses. <clears throat> and all of these guys who, who are referred to as slow horses have done, they've basically been really good agents, but they've done something to really mess up along the way they've all this cat, catastrophic kind of balls up and that's why they all end up in this place called slough house and they're known as the slow horses um and it's yeah it's it's uh i just literally just finished in fact i auditioned for it when i was um doing uncharted and then so i went from that to that and um and that was a great experience you know i mean gary oldman is my favorite actor i couldn't believe I'd got in something that Gary Oldman was in. I was going to actually meet him, you know. Um, and he didn't disappoint, you know. He's a, he's a gent. He's uh, he's very funny. Um, he's one of the boys. You know, he's one of the crew. Yeah. He's just sat everyone not like off in his trailer or anything. He's like, he was there all the time with us, you know, mucking in, telling jokes, um, being Gary Oldman. So, I mean, what a privilege. Um, yeah. And him as well, you know, you just look at him in the eyes and go, oh my God, you're Gary, you're the guy that I've watched in all these movies. And you, that that the intensity that he has, that stare, you know, that look that he has, that authority and a command and and humour, you know, it's just it's just all there. I absolutely loved working with him. Uh, a, a real pleasure, real privilege. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy the show. It's a great show. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm only a few episodes in, but it's every Friday on Apple TV, I believe. Um, it comes out. So yeah, I will be um, the next day I get off. I will be binge watching the rest of that definitely. And um, see how it ends up. But um, so going on to what we were uh, talking about before. Now, 
you were saying, obviously, since last summer weekends, you really wanted to get into filmmaking. And I do remember when I spoke to you a year or two ago, um, obviously, we were talking about short film that you're making. And obviously, like I was saying before, I, I went to acting school and I wanted to be an actor and things like that. And then I wanted maybe about six years ago, I realised I wanted to make films as well. So obviously, I'm making a short at the moment. But like you, you've made a few shorts already, haven't you? This is like your first, like, is, is this your first like big short film that you, you know, you want to yeah, get out there? It's a good way of putting it really because I've done I think I've done about six films in total but they've been they've been I've not put them on IMDB so they've been learning films you know they, that's that's for me to learn how to direct and write and direct and then um, how I want to execute them with pretty much you know the the early ones with no budget you know just literally just doing it and then yeah working towards more recently I just shot two short films uh, with budgets and you know with more organization with with some forethought and some um some crew and some um you know people who wanted to be involved and um and it's just been it's just been fantastic because it's been a long time coming i mean as i said i've been doing it i've been making films i suppose for like 15 years or something like that but i, I now feel for some reason like i'm really ready to be you know i've been writing as well and i've i've written about 10 feature films I'm, i've i've um probably more actually and I'm so I'm trying to I'm trying to I'm in post-production with both of these films right now the shorts the idea obviously is to get them out hopefully get them into festivals and uh, and then get feature versions made of of each of them so that's the right. overall plan but actually making the films was exactly how I hoped it would feel you know and and uh, and the results so far are looking pretty good so yeah all good I mean that's brilliant. So you've you've written and you've directed these films as well. Uh, have you um, have you been have you been acting in them or have you just stuck to behind the camera? Yeah, I've not been acting. In it. I thought that'd be too much. Um, and I had not, you know, I'm blessed in that I I get to be an actor. But um, yeah. I just thought if I in them, I wouldn't be able to concentrate as much as I'd like to concentrate in in directing other people, you know, and um, being creative as a filmmaker. I just thought it would take something away from me. Not, not everyone feels that way. You know, for me, it's like I'd like to concentrate on the things I've not been able to do. So, so yeah, yeah that's the reason. So, uh, like, obviously the goal is to get to feature films and things like that. Like, um, is there any, like, like genre you'd love to make a feature film in? Because I, 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 I'm a horror fan myself. Like, I'd love to make a really good horror film. As you can see, Freddy Krueger's in the background. Um, and I know you've done a few horror films yourself. Um, you actually, it was uh, what was it when the lights go out? I believe yeah, it was one that you did, yeah. And um, did you do one a year or two ago? Was that uh, was it oh, that, with Neil Marshall? Was that horror ish? Oh, I don't know if that was a horror film, record. but yeah, 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 so, a horror film. Yeah. yeah. So, like, is there any particular way you'd like to go, or is is it just whatever takes your fancy, and then you know you think it's a good idea, and you'd be like. I want to make this film or would you prefer to stick to a, a specific uh, like genre of film? I think for me, I mean, I would love to make a horror at one point, but um, for me, I'd like to make dramas and, and yeah. um, I can't keep myself away from comedy. So um, I've made, interesting with the shorts that I've made, the two ones that I've just made, one's a, a drama uh, and, and one's a, an out and out comedy. So I guess I've kind of, try to um to attack both things there and we'll see we'll see how they play out but um flipping between those two would would, would be my ideal um i love a good drama a good drama but i I'd, I'd always like there to be comedy within the, the drama yeah. you know just I, I i'm not a fan of watching serious films that are simply serious i just i can't because that's not real life you know even if it's absurd or something strange happens or something funny that's the way life is to me you know so so the really really heavy films that that are simply heavy for being for being you know for heavy sake i'm not really drawn to but i'm drawn to a really good drama when it's got these little you know it's peppered with humor so that's yeah that would be my ideal i suppose it, um but it, it was good to do um an out and out comedy as well and just right can we make this funny it's a lot of pressure doing yeah. that and 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 I guess I, I've sort of inverted that as well. I suppose I've I've peppered that with serious moments. So, mm. and that's how I like my comedies and, and, and I like my dramas with some humorous moments. So, um, 
I guess in answer to your question, yeah, comedy drama, I suppose. Or okay. drama comedy. So is there anything um, you can uh, like, can you tell us anything about the films that you've done? So if people are at film festivals or anything, you can look out for them when they get released? Well, one of them is Sex God, the one that I was um, fundraising, which um, finally, you know, that we, we, we were all ready to go. And then what happened with that was <laughs> there are a number of, we were ready to go twice. Then we had um, one of the problems when you have cast who they, they might not be major stars, but they're working actors. They start working. So getting everyone's schedules together becomes an absolute nightmare. Uh, then the pandemic hit and then we got it together and we made it. So um, Sex God is it's a battle of the sexes, really a comedy about a battle of the sexes. But it's it's quite philosophical. It's very funny, I hope, um, or it's intended to be very funny. Um, and it's really about how little um, men and women understand each other. That's really the essence of what that one's about. And the other one is a more serious drama about um, Vincent van Gogh. And rather than his painting, it's about his love life. I've concentrated on one aspect of his love life and sort of zoomed in on that and uh, something I'd like to explore. And and so that was a com had a completely different complexion, different palette of colours. It was um, uh, sort of almost monochrome, and and quite serious, but quite delicate, and hopefully a little bit beautiful as well. That's brilliant. I'm looking forward to seeing them. But I can I I, I really um, understand what you're talking about with like the actors and the crew and things like that. Because when you're making a short, you you're asking a lot of favours off people, aren't you? Like um like even myself now, I've you know, I've got quite a decent budget for a short film, but if they get offered work on a feature film or a TV show or something like that, you can't expect them to drop that and come and do a short film for like two or three days where it's going to be little to no pay or, you know, things like that. So like, I do understand like sometimes getting these films off the ground. I mean, even, I, I don't know if maybe for clarification, even with like someone like yourself or something that's been in the industry for so many years and, have has the resume that you do like from what you've just told me it feels like it's the same thing like even for myself you're going through that as well because you can't expect these people to even just drop everything to come and help their friend out even on a, a short film so exactly that and it's, it's the same for everyone I think unless you unless you've got a million dollars and you've got a star and you've paid your star and they're going to be there and everybody wants to be there you know yeah um, and Neither of us are in a situation to do that. So you're on what, whatever level you're on making a short film. I mean, it's great that you've got a budget. That's fantastic. That's that's at least going to incentivize certain people to be there. And mm. as you know, you end up being you're the writer director. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you'll be doing a lot more than writing and directing. You find yourself yeah. doing pretty everything. You know, uh, uh, not for, um, not. To, try and be uh, to extra challenge yourself but just just to get the thing made and to get things done it's like it's literally like um dragging a tank up a hill isn't it it's, it's yeah. um it's a it's a monumental task which sounds ridiculous because it's a short film it shouldn't take very long and everybody should be happy to be involved but it's never like that you know so so yeah i agree with it it's, it's an absolute it's an absolute challenge and um all you can do is try and inspire people you know to to be there with you and 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 get the thing made i mean getting the thing made is what it's all about i'm in post-production and, and it, i can tell it's going to take a long time you know because then the momentum slows down a little bit you're no longer in that in that zone where you're cracking the whip and and being mr charming and getting everyone there to help you and work with you um it's it's pretty much on your shoulders and the editor's shoulders and there's a lot to do in post-production, isn't there? There's a lot yeah, to do. Exactly. And, don't, and obviously, with like yourself, you've got to work in between trying to get that yeah. edit done as well. So it's like you can't constantly be there to... So even yourself, you're in the same boat as like what we were talking about with other people. You've got to go off and do your jobs in between actually doing your film, even though it's your passion project and you really want to get it out there. Unfortunately, it's having the time to actually do it. Because I guess if we had enough time to do that as well, we'd be playing video games all day. <laughs> there yeah. you go. That's why that's been moved to one side for me. But but um, yeah, it's and you've got your family or you've got your friends. Yeah. You've, got, you've got your life as well as your passion project and your bread and butter and your work and, and other things that you might want to do and your hobbies. And, you know, it's just, it's teeming, isn't it? And it's just, it's trying to, trying to get it, trying to get it finished in post-production. For a short, I mean, is you know, because it's, it's not as structured as as let's say a studio film or even an independent yeah. film that has 
a few grand behind it, you know. Um, so yeah, I think I think all filmmakers can relate to that and will know. And that's that's what makes you like minded in a sense because you know that it's it's you know how difficult it is. Yeah. And if you can yeah, finish, you, yeah. you, you hear short film, don't you? And everyone thinks, oh, what we do working on it for a week or something like that. And it's like in your head, it's like right, okay, we're going to get this done a year later, and you, you're still working on it. And uh, and um, years can go. Years can go. Yeah. And I mean, like as, as you've been saying, you've you've been writing for you know how long do you say? Sorry, was it? Um, well, was since. It since I've, I've, even before I started writing, I was still writing, but I did, you know, I was writing poetry or I was writing whatever yeah. story. But I started writing seriously, I suppose. I first, I first probably thought I'm going to write a screenplay in about 1993, something like that. After being with Michael Mann, he's like, right, I'm going to write a film, gonna, you know. So from there, I, I think, I, I suddenly, all the ideas, the, the arbitrary ideas that I was writing about came together with a focus to, to write a script. Yeah, really? So, so, yeah. I mean, I'm really looking forward to seeing them eventually when they're out and everything like that. So, um, you know, well done on getting it finished and everything. I hope the edit goes really well as well. And, um, so, um, obviously, um, I've taken up a lot of your time today, but I do have a question that I always like to ask everyone. What are the three films or TV shows, if you were stuck on an island and you couldn't watch anything else for the rest of your life, what would they be? Whew. Wow. Wow. Um... Gosh, I don't know. Do you know? I'll probably give you some answers, and tomorrow there might be different answers. You know, yes. um, let's have a look. Um, films or TV shows? I'll let you choose. Um, yeah. Um, Two thousand and one is a great movie. Um, I'd take that with me. Um, I was looking at your stuff recently, and you just did one floor of the cuckoo's nest, didn't you? Yeah. Um, and 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 I haven't I haven't seen that film for a while. I was toying with it a few months ago, and I didn't watch it. But I would take that. That is a classic. And my memories of when I saw that when I was a kid, I think I got into the cinema. There was a cinema that we could go to, and we could watch X-rated films, as they were called then. Um, and, and you were like twelve or thirteen, and they just let us in. But that that made a great impression on me. So I think I think I'd take that with me. Um, and Raging Bull. Raging, Raging Bull. Oh, brilliant Incredible. film. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> And um, so yeah, very, very good choices. So, um, pretty serious. Well, Not many comedies there. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, um, I, I thought there would have been a comedy in there somewhere. Actually, maybe if I give you five. But um, yeah, yeah. And as I but, say, you know, if you ask me tomorrow, it probably completely different. completely different. You, oh, yeah. I, sh I should have let you know in advance, give you some time to think about it. And uh, <laughs> but um, so, how can people find you online? Um, What's your um, social media tags? So if anyone social watches this, do you want to find you? So I'm um, at Stevie Wads Films on Instagram. That's the only social media that I have. So at Stevie Wads Films on Instagram. Um, Brilliant. Well, Steve, thank you for today. It's been an honour again to speak to you. And, um, you know, hopefully we can do it again sometime. And um, right. I wish you all luck with uh, the series at the moment. And um, I'm looking forward to um, seeing the short films out and everything like that. And um, I'm wishing you all luck to get them to features. And uh, yeah, it's been great. Thank you for coming on the film, Stooges. Appreciate it, Patrick. Thanks very much. Good luck with uh, this vehicle that you're doing now and adventure or, you know, whichever direction it takes. And good luck with your short films as well and hoping you get the feedback as well. Thank you. I appreciate that, Steve. Cheers. Thanks a lot, mate. All right. Thank you. Cheers. So. Well, we really hope you enjoyed our first show. Please like, comment and subscribe. And we'll see you all next time. This is the Film Stooges and I'm Patrick O'Brien.